Our next keynote hardly requires any introduction at all. Um, David spent 30 years as an independent producer uh, of award-winning films, inclu including The Mission, The Killing Fields, Local Hero, Chariots of Fire, more on that in a second, Midnight Express, Bugsy Malone, Memphis Bell. Uh, his films have won 10 Oscars, 25 BAFTAs, and you know the list just goes on and on. In 1998, he retired to, um, from full-time production to focus his work on public policy as it relates to education, the environment, and the creative communi uh, communications industries. Um, in 1998, he also founded the National Teaching Awards, which he chaired until 2008, also serving as the chair of the General Teaching Council from 2000 to 2002. Around about that time, I had the pleasure, it's a long time ago, but I had the pleasure of working with uh, Lord Putnam on a video um, targeted at college governors and David came in and did a splendid session at the end he said so what college what, what governors really need to focus on is and he went on and I was the other side of the camera and I said David that was brilliant we really want to make sure that the message though it targets college governors so could we take it from the top again and uh, could you say college governors which he did perfectly on the next take I've dined out on that story because I suddenly realised I was directing the, the director of Chariots of Fire. <laughs> and I've had, it's got me many a laugh in the, uh, in the pub quiz team when I've mentioned that. Um, without further ado, Lord Putnam of Queensgate. <clears throat> Thank you very, very much, Lita. Very, you were a very, very good director and uh, I've recommended you to any number of people. Uh, ever since. Um, thank you for having me. It, what's very nice this morning, first time in a while, that I've actually feel I've got some time to expand a little on, on what I want to say. I just got back from Nassau, where I was speaking at the um, Commonwealth Education Ministers Conference, and we were given 12 minutes. There's not a lot you can say in 12 minutes. I actually drifted over to 13, but it's really, I cannot tell you how nice it is to not feel that you've got to keep hitting the button and running and running through it. There's a number of things I'd like to try and do, if I may. Try and describe roughly where I think we've come from, where I think we are, we are, where we're going to, what I'm doing uh, in that context, uh, some of which I think works, some of which I'm certainly, I certainly see myself as a learner. Uh, and then we'll get into some questions. But uh, it's fairly broad ranging, and I even hope I can make you laugh once or twice. Now, the big laugh is whether this works. Yes, it does. Um, this is a, Remark, I thought it was rather brilliant last year from President Xi of um, China, because I think he's talking not just about China's future, but uh, in a sense, all of our futures. And I think it's particularly true of us in the UK, vis-a-vis -vis Europe, vis-a-vis -vis United States. I think that many of the old certainties, many of the places we used to look to, and in terms of the direction we were heading or what, what we actually, the aspirations we had, have proved to be, uh, well, less than satisfying. And I certainly now believe that uh, we can't look anywhere at all around the world as being our future. We have to develop our own sense of, uh, of tomorrow. I thought it was an extremely profound remark, particularly profound remark, because so much of the world has tended to look across the United States to the Statue of Liberty. That just isn't there anymore. There is no Statue of Liberty sitting on the White Cliffs of Dover, as we are all only too aware. Uh, one or two other realities that seem to have crashed in at last. Uh, Joe Stieglitz, who is, I think, a very great, very, very great economist, uh, makes the point, which all of us probably have been making all of our lives, which is that it's boilerplate economics, that universal education is the only path to prosperity. And I say not just to, to developing nations, but to developed nations as well. It is a global public good. I, I like the phrase very much. And his new book sets that out, I think, uh, admirably. Uh, so, oh, there we go. Um, this is a remark made last year by Simon Jenkins in the uh, Guardian. And again, I think he's, he's onto something. But what he's onto is not just about the child's mind, it is the fact that we are beginning to be able to explore and understand our own minds rather better. And I get involved, disturbingly, in some kind of odd conversations about brain science and the role that brain science might play in the future of education. And there is a kind of negativity attached to it. There were some probably bad experiments in, and, and false dawns in the 1970s and 1980s. But the truth is, which, which is, I find remarkable, we've learned more about the way the brain operates in just the last 15 years 
than we've learned in the whole of recorded history. And the idea that we can't begin to work with brain scientists and begin to understand ways in which their knowledge and their understanding of the brain applies, is applied to our world is, um, seems to me daft. And I think we've got to kind of get out of the trap of thinking that somehow it's a Frankenstein notion. Uh, but actually, these are people who we could collaborate with, I think, very, very productively in the years to come. Um, ooh, there we go. Uh, this is obviously self-evident. But it's not so self-evident that um, it doesn't continually bedevil us. And my concern for the UK in particular, and for other societies I, I work with, um, is that we, are, we have a tendency to lapse back into a false sense of self-satisfaction. That somehow the way that we're doing things is probably as, about as good as it can be done, and the degree to which we question and, and look at new ways of doing things is, uh, is, is, is troubling. And it's very odd. And I say this as a, it, 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 here I step away from my last 15 years working within the world of education. I do find it puzzling, and I've been chancellor of two universities, and I've said this at both of those, not always to great degree of pop, with great degree of popularity, is that the, the world, our world, that people look to to solve their problems is not a world that's particularly adept at solving its own problems. I find it very, very interesting that in the, in the very senior deans at universities who, will, who the rest of the world will bring specific problems to in their own discipline, when asked actually to sort out their own departments, have an incredible problem immediately. And that's something I think we have to think about. In his biography, uh, autobiography, Billy Wright, the England captain there, uh, talked about this match. And he said, looking back, he said he, walk, he walked out onto the pitch and he said, I looked down at the Hungarians and they were these, wearing these funny little slippers where we had boots on. And he said, I turned around to the rest of the boys and said, we're all right today, lads. They haven't even got proper football boots. And I think there's a frightening truth there, that somehow we assume, on, right there, that were our, these were our proper football boots, that we have the kit, we have the knowledge, we know how to do things, and that the rest of the world, in their own ways, either doing it wrong or will at some point catch up. There's a lovely line of Leon Trotsky's. You may not be interested in talking about the future, but the future will be very interested in talking to you. And I think that's uh, something we are not good at, have to get much better at, the particular process of looking, at, looking and learning of what other people are doing elsewhere. So all that comes around to the idea of um, educational reform. Uh, in my judgment, overdue and we struggle. In 1915, man in the front of the picture is a man called Robert Cushing. Uh, medicine took some huge leaps forward as a direct result of the First World War. Thousands and thousands of lives were saved as a result of experimental surgery, things we discovered, they, they discovered that could be done, and a brilliant generation of surgeons emerged during the First World War, some British, some French, some American in particular. A hundred years later, Mr Cushing and his colleagues, if taken into this environment, a modern operating theatre, would be able to do absolutely nothing. There is not one scrap of their skill base which would be usable. They would stand there scratching their heads, they could make a cup of tea, I guess, and ask what was going on, but they could not possibly be remotely helpful. Why? Because pretty well everything they knew and everything they learned and all those advantages they'd made had been obviated by technological change in the world of medicine in the intervening 100 years. Not true in the average classroom. <laughs> I think it's fair to say that this teacher would be loved and trusted at any point during the whole, certainly of the 20th century. And, um, and we don't sufficiently question why that might not be the case. We could, maybe in the Q&A session, like to get into it, but I think I have one or two, uh, one or two answers. One, one being that in teaching and learning, we tend to default to what we know because we're rather nervous at the idea of experimenting with a new cohort of uh, young people. Whereas in medicine, if someone is critically ill, both the, both the patient and indeed the patient's loved ones will say, look, anything you can do to try and make this work, please do it. And so medicine is constantly in the process of rediscovering what's possible, whereas we tend to be constantly in the process of doing what we believe and know works. Uh, I remember very distinctly, I was seven years old, when the first piece of technology was wheeled into my classroom, I'm 74 now, um, it was the radio. It was wheeled in, memory by the history master, uh, 
And they waited till exactly 10 o'clock, switched it on, and a disembodied voice said, good morning, children, and the program started. Now, we were kind of fascinated in the classroom. The, con the concern and the in terror that occurred was entirely in the staff room. The staff were absolutely convinced in 1950 that this was the end of the world as they knew it. And that all they were going to do in future was be responsible for trundling radio, very large radios around corridors and switching them on at the appropriate and designated time. As we all know, it didn't quite work out that way, but there was absolute fear. And if you look back at the pages of the Times Educational Supplement at the time, this was a very general fear and a sense that teachers were being de skilled, delegitimized, and it was the, the end of the world as we knew it. In the uh, mid-1980s, I was chairman of an organisation called Oxford Scientific Films, which at the time was the, the cutting-edge organisation um, creating special effects and wildlife uh, film, as it, as it were, in boxes. Uh, it was absolutely the cutting edge. Every single one of your students today in, within the college can replicate what we were doing and better. Every single one of them. So the world has moved from being you know, from the mid-80s to one organisation in the whole of the world, of scientific films, that could do things to a point at which every single student could replicate those things and find out for themselves and advance. And my argument, I suppose, this morning is that we are not utilising, haven't utilised, these capacities. But in a very good... Oh, God, that was not very clever. Uh, in a very good recent book, uh, Steve Hilton... Uh, and I do recommend this book. I was quite surprised that form, former advisor to David Cameron it came as a shock to me, but the truth is it's a very good book. <laughs> he says, we're all served by a system and a culture that assumes we've filled our brains once we've finished with secondary or higher or indeed further education. And I think he's absolutely right. But he's particularly right because we have an extraordinary tool, and this tool is digital. And digital, I would argue, in the world of teaching and learning, changes everything, or at least, put it another way, adds an opportunity, an entire layer, to what we do. Now, it doesn't always work out quite as we'd want it. Um, just take you through the pace of change. High-speed broadband became pervasive only in 2005, which is quite extraordinary. Since then, Google went public in 2004. Facebook, 2004. YouTube, 2005. Look at those numbers. Twitter, 2006. Kindle, 2007. Apple. June 2007. This is level of transformation that I don't think we as human beings have ever been required to kind of cope with before. But every single one of these uh, they are applications offers an, a, a learning opportunity. Every single one of them, some more than others. I use Twitter quite a lot. Uh, we'll talk about that later. But every, each and every one of you certainly can use one, one or other of these applications. There's some very good news. During the time I've been speaking, what, 15 minutes now, between 12 and 15,000 teaching and learning resources have been downloaded in 93 countries, 85% of which were created by teachers for teachers. How do I know that? Because the probably most interesting job I have is I chair the Times Educational Supplement, and I know exactly what our TES, Global and Connect sites are doing all the time. We know who's using them, we know when they're using them, we know the volume at which they're losing them. We know there's a big spike on Sunday nights. Not that surprising. <laughs> and quite, quite, quite incredibly, because I don't think any of us, certainly none of us on the board ever thought we'd reach this, we're now looking at a volume which averages out at almost 1.1 million transactions a day. 1.1 million teachers around the world are talking to each other, getting ideas and most importantly of all, offering ideas. There's been a huge growth across the whole world generated by open educational resources. I don't know, I can, I'll leave these slides with you, Marcus. But 8, 810,000 resources uploaded to date, around 50% developed by teachers, for teachers. Very interesting. Teachers overwhelmingly prefer to use other teachers' resources. That's to say, with the something like four to one is the ratio of people using teacher-generated teacher resources as it goes to proprietary resources, something, again, we didn't expect. 68% of teachers sharing lesson plans. Recommendations are very important. And a strong agreement that in learning from each other, teachers create stronger and more professional communities. Downloads are growing by 40% year-on-year. In May, latest, latest figure I got, 
670 million downloads, and as I say, growing every single week. This is from two th September 2008, this started. And almost more important, growth of resources, exponential. I know of no other chart, really, that, really, that parallels this. Now, this is going on in our profession. When I was working in department for six years, working for Estelle Morris, we had a surfeit, if anything, of um, pilots, you know, ideas, concepts, things we were trialling, any number of them. What bedeviled us all the time was scale. Always trying to find good ideas good, good, and good systems and then take into scale. It never crossed any of our minds, I promise you, a decade ago, that scale will actually come at us, but being provided by the education community itself. So I'd argue that with over 7 million registered teaching professionals now, this isn't just a theory. This is a teacher-led digital revolution. And we're seeing it growing and growing and growing as younger teachers come into the profession and take this up as literally part and parcel of their everyday practice. And the obvious lesson from this is that to be better educators, we must first be better learners. I think it's a, a, a deep truth. I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm 74 years old. I think I've learned more, and I mean this hand on heart, I've learned more in the past five to 10 years of my life than in any other period prior to this, simply because I've found myself literally greedy for access to information and the way that I can use the information that comes my way. And we've never had more tools. These are available, these are all editing tools available to anyone. So anything that's on the web, anything you want, you can pull off the web and use using these tools. And more importantly, the instructions of how to do it and how to improve your, as it were, professionalism are also there, mostly free. Not all, but mostly free. So in a sense, it's inexcusable not to develop your skills and not to develop materials available to you. That David uh, Attenborough clip is available to anyone, as indeed are pretty well all of his programs. The clip use in whatever form you think might be valuable to your, your students. Again, this is obvious, and yet as I go around the world, I see huge disparities between countries that really do value their teachers and others that, that, cease, that, that cease to. It was very apparent last week at the um, Commonwealth Education Conference. It's also the case that in more, many, many countries, education is still a political football. It's extremely hard to get a clear sight of where governments in different parts of the world want their education systems to go. And yet I'd argue that what government is about is priorities, priorities and choices. And when you start looking at the choices and looking at how you prioritise and how indeed you're going to resource the, your priorities in the future, uh, you're left with a very simple um, choice, which is this. Edu only education, only education, can possibly end up funding all the other imperatives of government. You, we will not have any form of social security unless we've got a rather brilliant generation of young people. We will not have a health sy system that's affordable unless we have a brilliant generation of young people. Everything in the end hinges on the quality of our educational output. And I, it absolutely more than confuses me. It really troubles me that successive governments somehow try to pretend that, we, that they can offer us a future which is distant from or, at, or outside of a brilliant and very, very well-resourced education system. As I see it, it's um, what we're asking young people to do, particularly in your sector, is move forward on a journey where effectively there is no map. And our job, I believe as educators, our job is a very simple one. Our job is to recreate a map for them that gives them some sense that they have a purpose and a future. I constantly, wherever I go, around, uh, uh, in, particularly in the UK, I come across very disillusioned, very disorientated young people. And I believe that we have a huge job in convincing that they really do have a purposeful future ahead of them. I was at a platform the other day with Larry Summers. Larry Summers, the former US Treasury Secretary, interesting man with a massive ego, but he said something that I found very interesting. He was describing the 2008 uh, financial crisis, when, and he had been the Treasury Secretary. He said, you know, we weren't stupid people. In 2005, we knew there was a problem, a systemic problem, uh, and we had plans, and we were looking at ways of addressing it. And in 2006, we expected there to be a real problem, a correction, as he called it, and it didn't happen. Uh, so we put the, the, uh, the plans away. In 2007, things got so difficult that if you even mentioned the fact that there was a systemic problem within government, 
you were, you were accused of being a cause of a potential problem. So he said, we all just shut up. It eventually hit in September 2008, and what was it? It was far, far worse than any of the contingency plans they've made in 2005 and 2006. So he, made, he said this, what you have to learn is that change takes longer than you expect, but when it does occur, it happens faster and I'd say more profoundly than you ever believed possible. And I think that's true in my, own, in my own field. I think it's true of climate change. I think it's true of many, many aspects of our lives where we become reasonably complacent. Remember the football match? We become quite complacent, and all of a sudden, this enormous shock occurs, and we cannot believe the speed with which we're being required to adjust and uh, reorganize. President Obama said one of the hardest things in politics is getting a democracy to deal with something now when the payoff is in the long term or the price of inaction is decades ago. I think there's again the profound truth in this. I think that human beings are somewhat like meerkats. We are actually rather brilliant at sensing and anticipating immediate danger. Our, our kind of scanning mechanism and our preparedness for immediate problems is, is pretty good. What we are terrible at is what I would call the slow boil problems. And in that sense, speaking of boiling, in that sense, we are like boiled frogs. We do not leap out of the pot because we water feels quite warm and no one's really telling us there's an emergency. And I think that is one of the uh, problems we have. It's certainly one of the problems we have in, in addressing the issues of our very fragile earth. Tom Friedman, a journalist I admire massively and read every day as well as I can in the New York Times, said, how we make the transition to a stabilized and still prosperous relationship with the earth and each other is surely the story of our time. And I regard each other as being as important as our relationship with the Earth. What's missing to me are a combination of trust, leadership, and compassion. This slide is here because I lost my best friend ex almost exactly a year ago, Richard Attenborough. He was more than my best friend. He was my kind of North Star. He was the person I looked to whenever I had a problem of, well, what would Dickie do? Where would he take this? How would he react and respond to this? He, unsurprisingly, had a whole slew of very close friends, including Nelson Mandela. And my argument really is that we... I was listening to Nicky Morgan this morning talk about British values. Uh, it is a, an empty and silly phrase. What isn't silly is a notion that we, there are a certain number of eternal, eternal values, and those values are absolutely based on concept of trust, leadership and compassion. And until we find that we have the sort of leadership that we can trust and who we do believe to be compassionate, we will flounder. Uh, back to Steve Hilton. We need an infrastructure that makes it possible for every adult to benefit from repeated bursts of training throughout their life by designing it in a way that fits in with their lives. I, um, I was very lucky, I, as I mentioned. I've been Chancellor of two universities, University of Sunderland the university, and the Open University. University of Sunderland was a very specific challenge. A, a post-industrial area it was absolutely on its ass in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very, very profound way. And we made, not so much me, uh, Anne Wright, the first uh, vice chancellor I worked with, made a fantastically important decision, which was her first responsibility was for the community, to the community, and to rebuild the community. It would have been very tempting, and incidentally, she put up with a lot of uh, problems with the, um, with the faculty who wanted the University of Sunderland, having been built, very beautifully built, to be a research-based university. <laughs> University, and she insisted it wasn't, that it was going to be a university that sought out and helped those in the community that, that needed it. And I think it was a brilliant decision because it became a different type of university and has had actually a lot of influence on many, many other universities. So that was a, a marvellous experience. Then coming to the OU uh, after 10 years and looking at that. Now, what I learned at the OU, which I think is directly relevant to this morning, was that we had been, the OU itself, had been obsessed by one metric. And that metric had been completion rates. It had all been about completion rates. So successful courses were courses that had high completion rates, and unsuccessful courses were courses with low, low, low completion rates. We then started driving past that simple metric to look at why that might be the case. And this particularly cropped up with a hugely successful course we ran called Understanding China. And Understanding China only had a 17% completion rate, which under normal circumstances was regarded as a failure. So we started drilling down a bit. We discovered that the reason was very simple. The people who took the Understanding China course knew exactly what it was that they wished to understand. It may be they wanted to do, do business in China. It may be they wanted to go there on a to visit to China. It may be, but they actually didn't need a certificate to stick on their wall 
to say that they understood China. They were perfectly capable of making a judgment as to what bit of that course was relevant to them. And it really did affect our thinking. We did start to think of courses differently. And that, in turn, had a bigger impact on the development of, uh, of future learn, which I'll come on to in a second, in beginning to realise that the business of diplomas and accreditation is, is all very well where you need it, but that there is a whole area in the world of education, particularly people who are in work and, and, and seeking education, where they know what they want, and it doesn't have anything whatsoever to do with the diploma. The employer might, that's possible, but also might not. One of the biggest mistakes, I think, we made in government while I was there was we were offered, I uh, can't remember what year, probably around 1999, uh, Microsoft offered to get very active and help us in developing the Microsoft Computing Diploma. And there were a lot of discussions. They were, they were prepared to put money into it and everything else. And in the end, we turned them down on the grounds that it didn't feel right to be too closely in bed with a, 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 with a, a provider. But the truth is, I think, in hindsight, it was a mistake. They knew exactly what the, the skills they could provide. They knew the skills that, pe that employers were looking for. And they knew much better than we did, actually, within the department. And I actually think that if we'd found a way of working with, in those days, Microsoft, maybe later on with Apple or wh whoever it might have been, working with the providers, working with the industry, in creating diplomas and courses that, that literally were tailored to what they, they, they could offer, we might have advanced our, uh, for example, coding. I think coding would have jumped by at least five years had we understood what the implication of coding was and the importance of coding was, instead of stepping outside of it and saying, no, 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 that's your job, we are, we're the Department of Education. I think we missed a lot of opportunities. So I think the big lesson we learned with FutureLearn was that we needed partners, that we couldn't do it all ourselves. Uh, and I would suggest that that's true right across the sector. The ability to, to, to reach out and say, well, who else is doing this? And who can we learn from? And how could we do it better? And there's no question that what we're learning at, uh, at, uh, at the OU through Future Learn is, is extraordinary. The other day, or well, the other day, one month ago, we launched a, um, a course, a joint venture course with the British Council, an English language course. I don't know how remarkable you think this is. In the opening week, opening week, 267,000 people signed up to the course. I mean, I come back to what I was saying earlier about the technology, that we are now dealing in numbers and at scale that I don't think very many of us in this room honestly imagined possible <coughs> 5, 10 or 20, let alone 20 years ago. Uh, the numbers here, almost 2 million registered learners studying over 3.5 million courses in 190 countries. This is, this is uh, I think, about 14 months after launch. 90% of students giving possible, positive post-post feedback course. 56% of students taking their first online course, 43% of them are in full-time work, 60% are female, and 60% from outside the UK. This is a success story. But it's a success story that has only been built on the acknowledgement and, rea and realisation that we had to have partners. And that's a tough thing for some institutions to accept. There, there is an institutional drive to do things yourself, or to believe that your department does it better. And the truth is, if you actually, we now have the resource to look, go out and look at who does it best, how can we partner up with them, and how can we use that to reach out. Last thing I want to talk about very briefly is what I'm doing. I live in the um, southwest corner of Ireland, in, in, in Cork, on the sea. This used to be my garage. It's no longer a garage, it's where I teach from. I teach in this room uh, using a Cisco telepresence system. I teach in five universities around the world, including Brisbane, as Singapore, uh, obviously one in, one, in, one in Ireland and two in, and two in the UK. Uh, I absolutely love it. They are two-hour seminars. I do ten two-hour seminars in each of the universities. I mentioned at the beginning that I use uh, Twitter. I do not tweet uh, for all sorts of reasons. Mostly I don't want to get, get myself in unnecessary trouble. But what I do <laughs> is I lurk, and I do recommend lurking to, uh, to all of you. When I've done... Uh, any kind of presentation anywhere, I check the next day as to what the responses are to it. And I look at what slides have got re re reproduced or what slides have been referred to it. And I'll just show you two, simply because these are the two that most often, oh, there are three actually, that most often crop up as being the essence of what people think they're getting <coughs> from, my, from my teaching. First one's this, I teach that creativity is a muscle. It's not magic, that of course the world is imbued with a few geniuses, but are very few geniuses. For the most part, 
It's about the things that go into creativity. Resilience, collaboration, imagination, tenacity, and focus. And what I tell them is the really important one uh, at the end of the day is, oh, drop that, I'm to go back to that, is um, it's not, it's supposed to bubble. You know, no, it's, it's, uh, sorry, the, the others all drop away and resilience starts popping up and down on a thing. And so we have a conversation about resilience. And what I've discovered is fascinating is, and again, you can please tell me I'm wrong, it's not something taught. We don't teach resilience, don't teach the importance of resilience. But believe me, if you come from my world, world of, of, of cinema, if you are not resilient, no matter how gifted you are, you will die in that world. It is resilience because you'll constantly be criticised by people who know less than you do. You'll constantly be told that your best work is not good enough. And unless you're resilient enough to take that and bounce back, you better find another way of earning a living. And they get that. You know, interesting. The other thing I teach them is about collaboration, that the person you're sitting next to could change your life. Why do I teach that? Because it absolutely happened to me. I shared a small room in an ad agency in the early 1960s with Alan Parker, Charles Saatchi and Ridley Scott. And we got on well, and we decided to try and help each other uh, make careers for ourselves. Charles, for reasons best known to himself, decided to stay in advertising. The rest of us definitely wanted to be in the movie business. Uh, so I did sit next to people who did, in effect, change my life. I like to think that I had an impact on them. And I believe that is true in almost every single lecture hall in the country. If people just would look sideways at the skills and, and potential the people they're sitting with and work with them, we're back, getting back to collaboration. It is miraculous what, is, uh, what, what can be achieved. Nearly there. I started off by saying the first step in solving a problem is recognising there is one. And I think we agree there is one. Uh, Mary McAleese, uh, who I admire hugely, said the quality higher education, I'd include certainly further education, and indeed all education, is crucial in enabling our institutions to produce the creative, adaptable graduates who will shape our future. And I happen to believe that the nature of those young people is somewhat different than it's been in any previous generation, because I think the challenges they're facing are different. The last and most uh, controversial slide I ever show is this one. This is a Gallup survey from December last year. 96% of college principals believe their institutions are successfully preparing young people for the world of work. 14% of the recent graduates agree with them, and 12, less than 12% of business, believers, uh, business leaders think they have the skills they need. Now, in many situations, you know, this is not a gap. This is a chasm of understanding. If these figures were, and I'm, I think I'll be generous here, if these figures were 70% of college principals and 30% of recent graduates, what I'd say is, well, there's a kind of misunderstanding here. Colleges wish to treat, teach the whole person and are looking for other sets of values than the, than the values the employer wants, and, 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 that, and that can cause a, a dislocation. That doesn't explain this. This is mega. This, what this should require, is, and this is exactly why I put the football um, film at the beginning, this should require the kind of fundamental rethink that says, you know what, we're doing something wrong. There's some piece of connectivity here that isn't working. Are we having sufficient conversations? Now, I know in the FE sector it, it, you do have conversations, but are we having sufficient con conversations with the employer groups? Do we really know what, where they're going and what they need? Do we really understand what the ambitions of our students are? At the, T, at the TES, one of the things we're doing with the, um, uh, with the listings is looking much, much deeper now at quality of teaching and learning. Much more, not just the, the notion of, t of, of student experience, because that's too easy to uh, but both, to, both the f to fake, but also it, it, to, to, to brush off. How good is the teaching and learning and how relevant is it to where that young person wants their life to go. And again, I'm just illustrating here that I think at the moment we have woefully little information and we may not be doing things as well as we believe we are. Finish with um, Steve Hilton again. Training is a vital weapon in the fight against inequality. We have to rethink how it's designed and delivered. As with poverty, inequality has the regrettable feature of worsening itself. It's a wonderful quote from the American Supreme Court Justice, Brand Louis Brandeis. We must make our choice. We may have democracy, or we may have wealth concentrated in the hands of a few, but we can't have both. My reason for being a Labour member of the House of Lords, my reason for being is that I profoundly believe this is true. 
I profoundly believe that democracy is not a done deal, even in the UK. And unless we begin to address the issues of a, of, of, of a generation that will have dreams and will have aspirations that will not be realisable, and will begin to look at other forms of government as short-term answers, we will have a, a huge problem. I'm a child in the 1960s. This was a mantra in the 60s that I was brought up with. You're either part of the solution or you're going to be part of the problem. I think it's truer today, truer today, than at any single point in my life, and infinitely more true than it was when I first, as it were, adopted it for myself in 1968. Thank you very much for listening to me. We do have... We do have time for a couple of questions, so we think of our assistants with the roving mics make themselves seen. Um, would anyone like to ask Lord Putnam a question in relation to what they've heard today? Okay, and down here. Take one more now as well. Anyone else? One over there. Thank you. Could you say who you are, please, where you're from, and what your question is? Um, I'm Gemma Fisher. I'm from Red Car Adult Learning Service. I was just wondering if you think that the um, disparity between medicine and teaching has got anything to do with the way in which we're judged and measured? Um, I, think le I sincerely think less to do with the way we're judged and measured and more to do with the way in which we uh, deal with the challenge we face. Uh, as I said, I think if the easiest explanation of this, what is actually a massive disparity, you would agree, is that uh, medicine really does, is, is built on the shoulders of giants. Med medics take chances because they, re they hit situations where unless they take a chance, the result is, 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 is a zero-sum game. Uh, we, don't, we never have, or very, very seldom, have that, but that, that set of binary choices. So we don't deal in binary choices. We deal in, it could be a bit better or a bit worse, and on balance, maybe we should leave things as they are. It's actually a really good question because I am... Um, one of the hats I wear, and I really in, enjoy it, I am the UK trade and culture envoy uh, to Southeast Asia. So I deal in Singapore, um, Burma, Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. Um, and I go twice a year for three weeks. I have also, for five years, was an uh, advisor to the Singapore government. And one of the reasons I've come to really admire and almost revere them is one very important thing. When I first got the gig as being an advisor, I thought, Broadly speaking, what they wanted was a group of people to come from the UK, there were four of us, uh, once a, twice a year, and tell them how well they were doing. I very quickly realised that but they were not interested in that at all. All they were obsessed by is what can we be doing better. Every meeting, and they would gather together all the civil servants, all the, everyone I ever needed to meet, and all the questions were, how could we be doing this better? Show us, do you have any ideas of how we could improve on this? I don't think we've fully developed that culture in the UK. I think we tend to, again, default to, we're doing quite well, and it's really not bad. And, uh, and if actually, if I try and make it that much better, I could, she could make my own life rather more difficult. Believe me, we are, if you like, competing with, and I don't like the notion of competing nations, but we are, we're competing with nations who see the world very differently. They see themselves on an upward trajectory. They don't have any interest in ever having an empire. They are. People forget Singapore, despite all of its rather strange human rights issues, is a socialist state. Uh, and they, their, their whole thing is, how can they improve the lives of the poorest people in Singapore? And they really do. Uh, it, it's utterly sincere. But this obsession with, how can we do it better? How can we do it better? And we, again, that's why I do use, and I do, it may sound silly, I do use that England football match analogy. And I think it really works. What we were guilty of was, was extraordinary complacency, and belief that somehow or other what we did was the best it, what best it could be done. And we got the most awful shock. And we never really fully, in a sense, recovered from it. So I think this notion of that the world of education, we don't constantly question how much better it could be. Having said that, by the, the, the sheer figures I showed you in terms of, 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 of um, content being delivered, individual <coughs> teachers at all levels in education are asking themselves that question and are attempting to improve their professionalism. And one of the things I would say to Nikki Morgan is she could, she could do herself a favour and spend a lot more time getting a full understanding of the degree to which uh, professionals do wish to improve their professional skills 
and maybe just spend a bit more time complimenting that rather than criticising what doesn't happen. Thank you. I had one more over there. Uh, Stephen Lay from Southend Adult Community College. Lord Putman, you've partly answered my question. It was going back to the football analogy and from your experience around the world, you know, where are the hungries of the education world in the future? Um, I mean, it's always, it, it, uh, you know, I will trot out Finland because they've done another huge jump. Uh, and another, they're another country that constantly questions uh, what they're doing wrong. Estelle Morris and I went twice, actually, to Finland in the... Um, in about 2000 and 2002, I think. Um, and what was wonderful about the trips there is that they couldn't understand what we were doing there. They didn't think they were very good. <laughs> and they were stunned and amazed to find themselves, you know, teetering on the top of the PISA charts, but not really understanding why. And what was hugely to their credit is they started to actually look at why it might be and realised that there were some very good reasons and some reasons that were questionable and they started building on the back of the things that seemed to be working and of course the big one was uh, the reputation of teachers, the way that society saw teachers and they realised very quickly that if teachers had a sufficient status and they could constantly improve the quality of the, of the intake they were going to, that would result in turn in a, in, in a better education system. I had dinner the other night with a lovely, lovely man who just arrived from the, he's the new vice chancellor of um, UCL, I think. Uh, just arrived from Monash University in uh, in Australia, where he's done an extraordinary job. And I uh, asked him how he was doing. He said, "Well, you know," he said, uh, "quite interesting." He said, "I've realised I've fetched up in a, a in an institution where I'm judged by how many people each year I can exclude." <laughs> I said, "Really?" He said, "Yeah." He said, "The whole point of uh, my university is if." The exclusion rate is really, really high. We're really exclusive and we're doing really well. And if we start taking in all this hoi and other people, he said, my reputation and my reputation and the reputation of my institution is going to drop. He said, I can't work that out. And I thought it was absolutely <laughs> wonderfully refreshing to hear a bloke. Now, being in the UK, within six months he'll join the Athenaeum and he'll understand why he'd... Uh, <laughs> but at least for the time being, he does see the lunacy of being judged on, the, on how many people he excludes and avoids having to take into his university. It's quite interesting. And I think that's what the, uh, the Finns have, have tweaked, that uh, it isn't about how many people you exclude, it's how, what, how, much, how many people you create a quality product that you can incl and, and, and include. But they are the obvious... Uh, they, it's, they still are the poster child, whether we like it or not. Well, one thing I would say, I, I, Andreas Schleicher, I, I like very much, actually, the guy that runs the PISA boards, I said to him... What will be the headline next time you report? And he said, I'll tell you exactly what it'll be. It'll be that rural Chinese schools are being as successful as Shanghai and, uh, and, the, uh, and, and the major cities. And he says it's going to be absolute shock horror. They will be out, rural Chinese schools can be outperforming US city schools. And we will immediately be asked to look again at all our data and the told that our, the way in which we go about our work is completely flawed. He said, it's not flawed. He said, because we're now building on, on year on year. But what we're dealing with is customers who don't want to hear the results. Now, it'll be interesting to see if he's right. Lord Putnam, thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>